Divine Truth Assistance Group. Group assistance sessions putting principles of divine truth into action. This recording is from the Developing My Loving Self group and is part of an Education in Love series. In the Accepting My Facade question and answer presentation, Jesus answers questions from the audience about the material covered in the previous presentation, Accepting My Facade. Recorded on the 22nd of May 2016 in New Seville, Queensland, Australia. All right, so the topic of this particular discussion is the Q&A on the subject we've just done, which is accepting my facade Q&A. So this is your chance to ask questions. If we start with Liam on this side, Jen there, and then down to Chris. Liam. Can you fully deconstruct your facade before you're at one with God? You have to fully deconstruct your desire, fa facade before you're at one with God. Okay, so you don't, it's not like as you keep going, little bits break off here and there. That until, is the until case. you actually reach the eights. That is the case, but you must fully <laughs> deconstruct your facade before you will become at one with God. Yep. yep. Okay, thanks. Yep. If we come to Jen and then down to Chris on this side. So, Chris, if you just put your hand up for, that's it, down to me. I'm very aware of how clever I've become <laughs> to re to responding to situations and people. Yep. And um, placating and conforming. Question is, how how do I know without having anybody else around me that I'm not just creating another facade, another response? Yep. Firstly, let's define clever. <laughs> clever is when you do things in your soul's best interest. Yes, that's not what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, so, so stop seeing it as clever and start seeing it as actually a self-destructive process. So, so, so one of the first uh, part of the attitude we need to deconstruct our facade is to stop seeing our facade as a clever mechanism and start seeing it as a self-destructive mechanism because it is a self-destructive mechanism. So that's number one. Without seeing it as a self-destructive mechanism, it's highly unlikely you'll have any aspiration to deconstruct it, to, to destroy it, right? Because you'll see it as something that's a good part of you, a best part of you, things like that. So, so we need to see it as something that we, that we need to destroy and therefore something that actually is not serving us anymore, not something that is serving us. Because it certainly might have served us in, his chi in our childhood, but it's certainly not serving us in our relationship with God, not at all. Yep. So that, that's very important. Now, the question you asked, Jen, is God's laws are all there to help you identify where you're out of harmony with love. And in your interactions with people, you will identify the particular problems that you have. Right? So, so my suggestion is engage life and engage people, but, but start doing so with a lot more self-awareness. What... what in other words, start seeing yourself as, as engaging people. What, what are my motivations for engaging this person? Why am I wanting to be here? Why do I feel like I need to be here? Why did I just say that? Why did I want that thing from them? What do I want from them? What, what do I want them to give me and what am I prepared to give them because I want them to give me that? You need, you need to have these interactions in the world in order to identify what the problems are, right? And once you've identified what the problems are, because God's laws are always trying to expose these problems to you, once you've identified what the problems are, then you are able to begin to work on what, you know, why you engage those particular things, why you engage this behaviour. Now, that's the long way of doing it, but it is also the way that the majority of you will do it at the beginning. And the reason why is this. This is the thing we need to address. The global refusal of the emotion of terror. 
Now, the majority of you are going to choose to avoid that. And instead, you're going to do it the harder way, which is deconstructing every single addiction that you have and removing every single addiction that you desire to have and, and, and seeing every single thing that you have in terms of what you desire to do. And you know you prefer to do that than you will to feel the emotion of terror. But remember the emotion of terror is the thing that creates the is is one of the two things that create the the facade. The other thing of course was the desire to avoid pain. And so if you address two global emotions which we'll talk about in a couple of days time, you have the potential to deconstruct the majority of your facade in a very very short time. But the majority of you won't do it. <laughs> because because you, you need to get to a state first where you believe you can feel the emotion of terror. And you need to get to a state then where you need to allow yourself to feel that you can cope with any pain. And that state takes a while to get to in terms of your aspiration, your soul-based desire. So the fast way to deconstruct your facade is quite simple. Feel the emotion of terror till it's done. Allow yourself to feel any pain, no matter what it is. <laughs> Thank you. That's quite simple, right? But as I say, the majority of you will not do it because it will be too intense. You, many of you will feel it's too intense. And what you will do instead, or what you will have to do instead, if you don't do that, is piecemeal, one by one, deconstruct every single facade you have, every single addiction you have. Yeah? Can you see that? This, this is all created because of this, the avoidance of this. You have two choices. You deconstruct all this, and even after you've done all that, you still have this. You still have this, won't you? Even if you deconstruct all this one by one by one by one by one, it might take you years, right? But this is what Mary has done. I, I did the first seven years. The first seven years of my work, that's what I did. Still got this <laughs> after that. And once I dealt with that, then things started to progress. Yeah. Now remember I've said to you in the first group that I've been doing this now for 20 years around about. 20 years this year, actually. And the first seven of that, I spent doing this deconstructive technique. Yeah. And then I went through some pretty major terrors. And once that started to happen, then I started to make some real progress. Yeah. Thank you. Mm. But we'll talk more about that in the two days in, in removing, when we talk about removing our unloving self. Who are we over here? Chris. Yes. Uh, I got two that sort of merge <coughs> into each other. Yep. Um, the first one is, if a lot of people love you for your facade, does it make it harder to remove it? For example, like a movie star or a yes, rock star? Yes, the, the answer is yes, yeah. Chris, it really does. Yeah. Um, the reason why is that, is that you become addicted to the... Uh, amount of emotion coming at you and this is what happens to famous people and um, they become addicted to the amount of emotion coming at them and the amount of emotion coming at them is very very intense and and a lot of the emotions are really they feel nice to the person and so and so they they, they find it very very hard to give up very difficult to give up and and yes it, um, it is quite difficult for the more fame you have, generally the more difficult it is to give up your facade because your fame is dependent upon maintaining it and all of these emotions are very dependent upon the emotions you're receiving from other people are dependent upon you putting forward the facade that you're actually in. So so it's a, it, it cuts both ways, doesn't it? We, we, on one hand, people are looking for fame, but on the other hand, the more famous you become, if you're absorbing the addictions as a way of getting to that fame, then it's, ter it's a terrible, 
terrible effect on you. And people in uh, people who pass, like I've had a conversation with Elvis. I know that sounds funny, but um, but I did have a conversation <laughs> with Elvis, so I can't lie about it. Um, and and he said that he he changed his name. Well, after he passed, he changed his name to John, and because John was the most popular name he could think of. It. <laughs> and and he, he also spent a lot of time in isolation trying to disconnect from all of this stuff coming from Earth because every time he felt all of these emotions coming from Earth, he felt drawn back here and then he'd get himself in a mess again and he couldn't progress. So he, so he decided to change his name and he stopped singing altogether. Like, so for many years, in fact, he still wasn't singing when I talked to him. And um, he, at that stage, he was in the second sphere, so he'd progressed from the first to the second sphere. Um, so this was uh, when was the conversation? It was it was about uh, nine years ago that I had this conversation with him. Um, I have I've had a few since, but this is the one that you know the first conversation I had with him. Um, so he he passed. I forget the year he passed. It was in the Was it or is it eighty something? But anyway, um, I can't remember the year he passed. But for for the first ten to twenty years of his passing, he 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 was drawn back to the earth all the time because of these addictive, you know, these codependent addictions. And and in the end, he decided the only way he could progress was change his name and stop singing, which he did do. And once he did that, he started to be able to work on himself and he'd progress to the second sphere by then. And and, and the reason why he did that was because it helped him avoid the projection of emotion coming at him from Earth about his fame. Yeah. So, yeah, difficult, difficult. Thanks. Good question. Second question. Second one. Um, can a facade be flimsy and half-baked or <laughs> is that the facade? <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, a facade can be ad hoc, shall we call it, <laughs> where you put it together on the fly <laughs> and we frequently do it. Um, you, you, uh, exa an example is we're, we're pretty, most people are pretty sensitive emotionally without being aware of their own sensitivity. So what happens is you walk into a room, you feel a certain vibe and all of a sudden you know what you've got to become to meet that vibe. Does that make sense? And most people will become what the vibe presents, will become what the vibe demands. And when I say vibe, what it is is the amalgamation of the soul desires of all those people present in that particular location. And so we walk into a location, the amalgamation of all the people present present a vibe, a, a soul-based condition, which our soul can feel. And then we instantly, depending on what injuries we have, we instantly try to meet those particular things. So that's like creating a facade on the fly. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and um, pretty much everybody does it. Yeah. Yep. The, the more rigid a person becomes the more, and usually that comes with older age, yeah. usually the less they do it, but, but they just walk away from it. You know, they say, oh, this doesn't feel good, I'm leaving, type of thing. They, they don't meet the vibe, if you like, meet the demands. But the younger we are, the more highly likely we are to actually meet that vibe. Yeah. Yeah. Trying yeah. to fit in and be cool and all yep. that. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the younger we are, the because... Because we're more emotionally sensitive when we're younger and because we haven't learnt yet that, you know, sometimes meeting a vibe is hurtful to self, mm. uh, frequently we'll meet it. That doesn't mean the older person is not in a facade. They're just in a facade that's not comfortable with that environment. Mm. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. So we're better yeah. off if we're going to be in that. Well, wait a minute. Uh, what were we going to say? Sorry, if we find ourselves like becoming a facade in an environment, we're better off leaving. Or just questioning it? Uh, yeah, I see, again, for myself, uh, my feelings are you're better off sort of just sitting down, getting to an alone place if you can in, in that environment, yep. sitting down and just still feeling the vibe, still feeling the actual soul amalgamation of the yep. soul condition of that location. Sit down and think, what am I responding to here? What, 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 why is this sort of calling me? You know, what, what, why is this drawing me into its web? You know, because that's what it is. Yep. Um, and, and question why. Yeah. yeah, yeah. If, of course, uh, you feel that it's drawing you into sin, in other words, it's drawing you into doing things that are out of harmony with love, 
then you'd probably be wise to leave until so, and, and still sit with the feeling that you had. Does that make sense? Yeah. In other words, you, you're better off taking an action that removes you from, some, some, from a location calling you to sin than, than it is to, to stay in it. And, and as, the, as the saying goes, tempt fate. When, when I feel it's really tempt your own addictions, yeah, you, you see. Um, but that, again, is a soul-based choice, isn't it? Like you'd have to choose to do that. Yeah. Many, many times, you know, something might happen by so-called accident, but our soul is usually always attracting things. Something happens, our soul's attracted it. We think it's a bit of an accident, you know, it's a combination of events that are pretty unlikely, but it's happened. And then... Um, what we decide to do with our will becomes the key critical factor. Does that make sense? So, so we can decide to leave a location that's influencing us in a direction that we know is going to be turn out bad. So, for, so for example, as a as a young guy, you know, going and playing at gigs, for example. You know, there's times when girls will come up and they admire you and they want to, you know, and they think that taking you to bed's the way to get some approval and so forth, and you get that offered to you, um, you know it's not in harmony with, you know, your morality or sense of ethics, and so so what would you do? Would you stay in these kind of environments all the time? Or, or if, you have the, if you have the addiction to do it, then you'd be better off first working on the addiction, wouldn't it, before you went back to those environments? Otherwise, there's a higher likelihood that you would engage the engage the offer yeah yeah so yeah it's very good questions good answers thanks yeah, yeah thanks <laughs> <laughs> is it he was sincere so <laughs> when he even said that kelly <laughs> thank you <laughs> thanks thanks chris so is there the decision point like under under the sin there is that the choice point that we either choose to be unloving or loving. Is there an in between? Like we see the see the list of will engaged down the side. Yeah, you can see will is engaged at every level. Yes. So 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 you you need to know how to use your will at every level, not just at the base part. Is yes. that what you were meaning? Yeah. So yeah. like whilst that's in play all day every day, mm -hmm. um, I'm going in and out of somewhere with my will. Yep. So sometimes you use your will lovingly, yes, and sometimes the addiction is is really strong, and you you're tempted by an event, yes, and you don't use your will lovingly, right? Does that make sense? Exactly. Mm. So the times when I'm questioning mm -hmm. what's going on in the interaction, and I'm not, I suppose that is an action of my will, isn't it? It is. Of yes. Just questioning self awareness. Remember, what I'm doing. Remember, it begins with some self analysis. So, yeah. so if you're questioning what's going on, that's the beginning of the aspiration to use your will positively. Yes, and so avoid that, a good thing. that whole um, yeah. sin city yeah. place. Yeah, sin yeah. city over there. <laughs> yeah. And um, because whilst I'm in all of that, I'm I'm not protected at all by God from God's perspective, am I? Um, be careful about making sort of what I'd classify as global statements about individual situations. It's like um, God's laws are, have, have been created to protect the human soul, not to protect your body. You understand? Mm -hmm. All right. Does everyone get that? They've been created specifically to protect the human soul. So, so the primary, the, but this is the highest laws I'm talking about, God's lowest laws protect the body. So, so the law of gravity protects the body, for example. Um, we often think of it as not protecting the body, but the reality is it does. It, it, it sticks us to the ground and stops us from flying out into outer space. So it protects our body. So a lot of God's physical laws protect our physical body. A lot of our, our God's spiritual laws protect the spirit body. And a lot of God's, all of God's soul-based laws protect the soul. Right, so don't think you're out 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 of uh, protection um, mm. at any point in time because the reality is the whole universe has been constructed for your protection. The mm. laws that govern the universe have been constructed specifically for the protection of the human soul. Mm -hmm. So, so, so that being the case, there are moments when God cannot assist us due to our choice. Right, 
So if I choose to engage my facade, I am breaking God's laws that protect my soul and my spirit body and in many cases even my physical body. Right? And so in that moment I cannot expect to get additional protection aside from the our guide you know the the well, it's more our guardian the the the, uh, the person who's a spirit now who has been assigned to help you protect yourself trying to badger your ear <laughs> and tell you don't do that don't do that you know it's the wrong thing to do and it just depends on how much we listen to that person as to whether we'll be protected in that moment does that make sense thank you and yeah. can i ask one more thing yep so is this a scale of um, unlovingness and a debt that will have to be repaid to God and uh, ourselves? Well, you're already paying it. You're already paying the debt. The way the law of compensation works, which is the law that governs the correction, it's the primary law that governs the correction of the soul unless you engage God's higher laws of the soul, which are the laws of divine love, well, most of you are not engaging those higher laws, so the primary law that engages the protection of your soul is the law of compensation, which compensates you for good deeds, for good motivations, and, and corrects you for error-based motivations, for bad motivations, unloving motivations, right? And the reality is you're already paying that penalty right now, right now. So, you know, getting old, wrinkled, having pains here and there, you know, all these things are all... The result of paying the penalties that we've accrued over our lifetime. Does that make sense? There's no extra penalty. It's not like we are already we are already paying it right now in this moment. So, but if I cause pain on myself and others, then you'll create be another penalty. Yes, repentance to do. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, but but. You've got to bear in mind the law of compensation is already operation and you don't have to engage the law of repentance. That's the point of the law of compensation. We'll talk about the laws later, but the point of the law of compensation is to, is to have a compensatory action upon the soul of an individual who refuses repentance and forgiveness. And we're already in that state, so that the law of compensation is already working. It's already doing its job. Right. Yeah. Wonderful laws. Thank you. When we talk about the laws, like, there's wonderful laws. <laughs> they are, they're just remarkable. It, it, the intricacy of the design of God's laws are absolutely incredible. I've spent most of my life studying them. Most of my life I haven't spent studying material universe but studying God's laws and the, the law-based effects on the, on the material and spiritual and soul-based condition. Fascinating subjects. Awesome, thank you. Mm. Okay, if we go to Shula and Louise on this side. Um, how do you know the difference between a real emotion, a false emotion, and a self-deceptional emotion? <laughs> Good question. Um, when you feel a real emotion, your whole world will change instantly. When you feel a self-deception emotion, nothing changes at all. So the way you tell whether emotion is self-deception constructed or actually a real pain-based emotion is by the effect it has after you've felt it. So Easy to understand? Yeah, I think so. Yep. Yeah. So the, the effect being that if you feel it and everything starts changing straight away afterwards, then it means you felt something that was actually a causal pain-based emotion. If you felt, you know, th there are times when you feel some of it and so it hasn't changed, but you always see an effect even if you've released even just a small portion of a causal pain-based emotion, there will always be some measurable effect in your life where something changes, always. That's God's feedback system. It's wonderful. You know straight away whether you dealt with something or not. You follow me? So, so this is like an uh, example. I've given you the example that I've been working through a lot of stuff about um, worth issues, right? 
And and I'm still no, you know, I've still got a lot of work to do on it. But but the reality is, every time I do something, bang, instantly I get emails from people about something related to it. I get certain things happening, uh, you know, positive things happening immediately. Um, and I know I'm not doing it in addiction or anything like that because I I've, <laughs> don't feed people's addictions very much at all for a long time now, right? So, so it's all to do, and I know it's not spirits because most spirits hate my guts. <laughs> when, I, when I say hate my guts, it's not true. It's like obviously, all my celestial friends love me, but, but, but most spirits who are attacking me don't like any me to have any success whatsoever about anything. So, um, so, and quite often that's an effect too that I get that I actually measure. So when I get more attack, usually I, I go, I'm getting more attack here. This is a good sign. <laughs> It is a good sign, isn't it? Because it means you're not conforming to the world. You're conforming less. The more attacked you get, the less you're conforming, right? So that's a good sign. So I sort of see that as a good sign. Most of you sort of see that as a bad sign. You go, oh, it's getting harder now. I'm going to give up, whatever. That's the point of their attack. They want you to give up. Like, I go, I'm going to attack now, you ripper. <laughs> that means that I've actually made a bit of progress here, you see? Yeah, and sometimes the attack gets pretty intense on myself and Mary, like pretty intense attack. And, you know, there's not, you know, if you think about the hundreds of thousands of people who have heard divine truth, how many of people actually like us <laughs> of those hundreds of thousands of people? There's not very many. Um, most of them feel very angry with us and very upset with us and in a rage with us and so forth. And we get lots of expressed rage all the time, of course, from Christians and others. But but um, the more that happens, the the less the more I feel I'm progressing. Does that make sense? So there's ways to measure all of these things. You remember, you're living in a world that's going to oppose you doing this. You are. So everything's not going to be smooth sailing, but internally you will feel happier. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. You can't expect the world to love it, but you will. <laughs> you will. Where are we over here, Louise? Um, just wondering how the hurt self feels about the facade self. Is it annoyed with it or sort of barracking that it'll give up the facade or doesn't it know that it's there? Or? No, the hurt self wants the facade. The hurt self demands the facade because remember the goal of the hurt is to avoid its pain and to avoid terror. <coughs> right, so... So yeah, the hurt wants the facade. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a big problem when you think about it, isn't it? Until yeah. the hurt disappears, there's going to be a desire to create facade, and in particular until this particular problem disappears. This terror, yeah. the terror-based emotion, the response to fear. Most of you still have it, where any time you get afraid, bang, you're responding. You're responding before you're even thinking. Uh, oh, hang on a sec, I was just afraid and now what am I doing? Well, you know, you're already doing by that stage and that's an indication that this part hasn't been dealt with. Once you stop automatically responding to fear, you've dealt with a bit of this terror. Not through an intellectual use of your willpower but through, through a feeling of will. You won't have to think about it. You'll just feel, no, I'm not going to do that and you just feel to not do it. You mean face your fear? Oh. No, I mean you feel you will not live in your fear. You will not take an action that validates your fear. Does that make sense? So, so yeah, the, the reality is the pain, the hurt self, if you want to call it the hurt self, wants the facade as much as the facade wants the facade. Mm. Oh, yeah, I was under the illusion that the hurt self had some truth about it, you know, that it... Uh, the hurt self has very little truth about oh, it, actually. Okay. We'll, we'll learn that. Yeah. It was, when we talk about, we'll talk a bit more about the state of the hurt at another time. But um, yeah, very little truth in the hurt self. Yeah, most of you, example, most of you, the hurt self believes that in the world we live in, you're not going to probably get loved. That's your hurt self. Yeah. Completely a lie. Mm -hmm. Completely a lie from God's perspective. God already loves you and you're just not feeling it. So it's completely a lie. 
but the hurt self believes it. Oh, so all the, the the negative beliefs are in the hurt self. Most of them, yeah. Um, Most aspect. of them, yeah, yeah. Remember, this is why I've written this down: false beliefs and definitions of love. Like they they are all in the hurt. They they are all there. And there's a lot of falseness in the hurt. A lot of false beliefs. The hurt is a reflection of how it's been treated, but not how it's been treated by God. It's a reflection of how it's been treated by the world, society, parents. It also is a reflection of what you've done to harm others. You follow? The hurt is. Because a lot of our pain, our personal pain, is actually the sin we created as well. The choices we've made to harm others. Right? And, and those particular things exist in the hurt based around these false beliefs and false definitions of love. And, and so false beliefs being the opposite of truth and false definition of his love being the opposite of love, evil, right? not love. And, and it's the false definitions of truth and the false definitions of love that drive the hurt. The hurt is driven by them. And so one of the things the hurt wants is for the facade to make out that it's all not as painful as it, what it really is. Right? But we need to bear in mind that, that from God's perspective, you will be loved. You are loved. From your hurt self's perspective, it's highly unlikely you feel you'll be loved. Does that make sense? So your hurt has a lot of false beliefs. So that's the part that finds it hard to develop faith. Yep. Yeah. Yep. It's your hurt self that it finds faith very difficult because your hurt self has had proof in its past that faith was pointless. That's how it feels. Of course, it's never had faith in God. It's never had faith in God's goodness. It's never had faith in God's laws because it never learnt any of those things. So all of us, we're all the same. It, there's, we haven't had faith in God's laws in our hurt selves. No, even those who are yeah. religious have no, yeah. no faith in God's laws. Yeah. That's the reason why they created religions that surround sacrifice and why they create religions around, you know, all the punishment of the wicked and why they create religions around, you know, the reward of those people who do God's will while on earth, We're not understanding that God's will is that you love, you know, and, and exercise your free will with love. And so, so the reality is all of the religious faiths that so-called have faith in God, the majority of them have faith in a punishing God. They don't have faith in a God of love. They only have faith in a God of love for the good. You follow? Mm. They only believe that if you're good, then there's a God of love. If you're not good, then God's going to destroy you. Right? So what's that? That uh, really isn't that faith in a tyrant. Or an uh, what's the word for that? It's a, a dictator. It's really a sadist dictator, really, right? A megalomaniac faith. That's that's what they really have faith in, but they don't have faith in a good God. Yeah. Yeah. So and just the, one uh, quick thing. Um, yep. So like the new age in a child aspect, or my inner child at a certain age. So yep. that's not the hurt self. Then. Pro yeah, it is mostly. Yes. Yeah. 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 And, and the problem with it is the new age in, uh, idea of inner child honours the inner child yeah. more, than, more than wants to feel, just feel its pain. The, you know, it does, the new age concept is let's feel some of the inner child's pain but let's believe it's true. <laughs> yeah, I think that's my illusion of I thought there was something really good and honest in the hurt self. Oh, there's there's some honesty when you feel the pain of it, certainly, yeah. certainly, and and you do need to feel the pain of it in order to release it, certainly. But but for the majority of people, they don't release the pain of it, and instead they live in the hurt. And and many of us are doing, you know, whenever we're not living in our facade, the, the rest of the time we're living in our hurt generally. But it's still not our real self. It's still not the development of our loving self. You follow? Yeah. yeah, thanks yeah. very much. So it's, it's very important to see the distinction because um, most, of, most of the time th there's a lot of new age and psychological concepts that talk about connecting to the inner child, right? And you do need to connect to the hurt. So I'm not saying you can't do that, but you need to connect to it and release it and get God's definition of the truth of it, you know? And you do that by releasing your truth 
by, and when I say your truth, whatever happened to you, you're honest about it and you cry about it and you release it. But once you've released it, you will no longer live in the definition of it. You will no longer believe what it believed. Right? So at the moment, like for many of you, like I said, many of you believe that you know, there's no love for you. There's no such thing as a soulmate. There's no, su you know, there's no such thing as a lot of things because this has been your experience. And so what, what you finish up doing is you, you, start, you go, start going, well, when I connect to my hurt self, I feel all those things that are the truth. No, they're not the truth. They're not God's truth. They're the results of your life and what effect your life has now had on your beliefs. That's all they are. And they're false from God's perspective. And this is why it's so important if you're truly going to heal psychologically, it's so important to get God's perspective. Because it's impossible to heal psychologically unless you get God's perspective. So the whole, the whole psychoanalyst field needs to change in order to have God's perspective about what is the real person and what is the hurt and what is the facade, rather than, rather than sort of seeing the hurt as the real feelings. That you have and that you're always going to have. Mm. Thanks very much. Yeah. That's great. So there's a lot of change there that needs to happen in the medical profession. If we come to Bruce on this side and Talia down the front here, Hello. sorry, and then we'll have you. If we, if we come down to Thalia here, so, so Bruce, far away. I don't want to get one of those cards. So just quickly, um, my <laughs> <laughs> so you have a fear. I'm not going to fear straight up. <laughs> Um, so you're asking a question in fear, are you? I'm really struggling, yeah, because I've got this thing about my facade that I have that this is my will side of my creation to mm -hmm. my facade. On this side, I've got this um, error side that society, parents, etc. So I create all these facades, you know, and I have a pretty good facade yeah. which attracts people to me, you know, to do things and yeah. create. Yeah. Now, so my question is, to to dismantle my facade, mm. um, am I going to dismantle yeah, all that creation? Very interesting, isn't it? Of course, yeah. And all those people that are isn't that a scary thought? That's why you've been avoiding it, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was going to say talk about that, but that was, that was a story. You see, nothing created by the facade, from God's perspective, is going to last forever. Nothing. It can't last forever because from God's perspective, all of God's laws are, are trying to destroy it. Does that make sense? So everything you create in your facade, parts of it you will find have been good. Parts of it have been driven by pure motive and so forth. So in the creation of your soul, whatever your soul creates, what, what actually happens is you've got a part that's of you that feels positive and passionate and good about creating a certain thing. And then you've got, mixed in with that, you've got a whole heap of pain driving, driving it. And mixed with that, you've got a whole heap of facade driving it, right? So that's all now the combined action of the soul is a mixture of some small spark of probably some small spark of passionate, real soul-based desire that's in harmony with love mixed with some pain that comes from your past mixed with quite a lot of facade in order to get the thing done. Do you follow? Yep. So it's a mixture. The only part of that creation that's going to survive, from God's perspective, is the spark that began with the pure motivation. Everything else, God's going to destroy. <laughs> Great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's quite confronting, isn't it? So, so what happened in my life? I had I'd built up this whole mountain of things, right? And then as soon as I start engaging all this, what happens to the mountain? <laughs> and I ended up with myself. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> that was it. And, uh, and then after I ended up with myself, I start creating proper things, you know, things based on pure motivation. And now, you know, things start building up again. Do you, do you know what I mean? But yeah, that, pretty much everything got destroyed. That was sort of like that I was coming to that my facade while it's a lot of my will power to create a will you know, create that to, in defense of um then i've got this you know society error which so yeah. we're you know if I were, if we're globally in a facade the world and the people everyone yeah. operating in it yeah far of you um so therefore 
I'm really going to fall out of that. Yeah. Yeah. And everything that you And that's what of, confronts you about doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Because cause, cause that's where you're getting most of your addictions met as well. Yep. So, so yep. this is why it gets real hard. You know, sometimes we, we confront doing it and then we go, geez, that means pretty much everything that I've done is probably going to get undone. Yeah, 40 years of work. 40 years of and then, 50 years, 100 years, whatever, how long we've lived, mm. gets deconstructed. And the majority of it, the majority of it, we had some spark of pure emotion, but the rest of the time we were in some kind of addiction. Uh, and so the majority of it's going to get destroyed. And we're going to be in, end with the spark of pure motive, which was the only thing that got created that was the good thing from God's perspective, you see. Yep. And they ended with that. So we're not completely destroyed. We end up with what is pure, which is great. It's exactly what we need. Because once you've got a pure motivation, now your new constructions will all last. And they'll last forever. Because they won't get destroyed by the universe. God's laws That's are supporting That's a pretty big leap of faith, though, isn't it? Uh, From where we are in the... In the well, I suppose it is, but see, see again, to me, it feels like, well, God's good. Of course it's true. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Of course, if you have your motivations pure, whatever you begin to create through those pure motivations, of course, are going to be supported by all, God's, all of God's laws. All of God's laws. Thanks. Like, I, I lived for 33 years on earth, 34. I was in my 34th year when I died in the first century. Like 2,000 years later, most people know me or think they do. <laughs> <laughs> now, you look at another person who lived, like wealthy people who lived in my time, who had far more wealth, far more, you know, far more uh, things than I had, far more part of history. Can you remember them? Not you really. probably couldn't name one of them, no. right? Except the ones that were involved in my life. <laughs> <laughs> or real famous ones like Nero or something like that, you know. And why is that? Because most of what they created got destroyed. You follow? Yeah. Well, yeah. If you look at civilization, that's what happens, isn't it? No. Historically. It's not what happens with God's laws. It's what happens no. because God's laws are about deconstructing anything that's out of harmony with God's laws. Yeah, I meant like the Roman Empire. Yeah, well, the Roman Empire, out of army God's Empire. laws, most of it gets destroyed. Yeah. Eventually, they all get destroyed, right? But the only things that live on are the things that are in harmony with God's love. Isn't it wonderful? <laughs> the things that live forever. So, so this is what I like about creation. If I create in harmony with God's love and God's truth, I am guaranteed by God's laws that my creations will live forever unless I choose to destroy them. But if I create out of harmony with God's love and God's laws and I create in my pain and in my facade, I am guaranteed that sooner or later it's all going to be gone. But this is also a great comfort to a lot of people in the spirit world, believe it or not. Because, uh, you know, like I have a friend in spirit world, Luther, you know, you've yeah. heard of Luther. The, uh, I met him um, well, after he passed, you know, short, when I say shortly, about 50 or 60 years after he's passed. But he, he feel, finds great comfort in the fact that his creations on earth that were out of harmony with love will be destroyed. And you know why he finds comfort in that? Because millions of people now follow him, yeah. follow his teachings. That, are, that were out of harmony with love, right? Some were in harmony and some were out of harmony with love. And, and, and he's very concerned about that. He, he wants to fix that. But he can't. He can't fix it. And the only thing that really is going to fix it is this law, this law that says that anything that's out of harmony with God's universal laws will eventually get destroyed. And so that's his comfort. So he's now a celestial spirit. Who's doing his who's utmost to destroy what Creates. the parts of his creations were out of harmony with love himself, but the reality is he knows that he personally can't do it without God's laws taking the action for him. 
So that's a comfort too, huh? So that it's comf- that's a comfort to any person who realizes that, oh, gee, I've created a whole heap of bad things and now what? Now what? It's going to be there forever. Well, no, it's not. Mm. It's impossible for it to be there forever. It's wonderful <laughs> that it's not going to be there forever. Yeah. So it has loving benefit in both directions. So while you're concerned about it, yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. only your addiction that's concerned. Yeah. You know. And my, are, fear, my fear. Your fear. My fear of, yeah. yeah. Yeah, your fear is the concern. Very good question though, Grace. It's, uh, um, our fear drives um, many of our constructions without any concept or respect for the fact that God's laws are probably going to destroy what we create. It's interesting even on earth. You see it playing out physically, emotionally and spiritually. So you know, on earth, for example, the homes that are built more in harmony with love last longer. So there's some homes that have lasted 2,000, 3,000 years on earth. And that's because I'm not saying they were built with love because a lot of times they were built with slave labour or whatever. I'm saying the actual home itself constructed of the right material in harmony with love and not not the constri- not the people who construct that they weren't very much in harmony with love, but they last the longest. They're going to last the longest because they are more in harmony with the physical laws. The things that are in harmony with law last longer than the things out of harmony with law. And the reason why that is is because God's laws have been constructed to to deconstruct, to destroy anything that's out of harmony with God's laws. Good, good to know. Thank you. That's why you see, see the see. Can you see the law discussion we have in November? It's going to be fascinating, right? Yeah. Yeah. Something to look forward to. <laughs> All right. Well, we better make a break. Um, I've already gone five minutes more over time. So what we'll do is we come back at quarter to uh, two, quarter to two, and um, and then we'll do some uh, personal group feedback at that point.